The first item of business is general questions. And at question number one, I call Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will conduct an independent review into the maternity model in Keithness. Cabinet Secretary Hamza Yousaf. The maternity model in Caithness was put in place by NHS Highland. That was following a review led by Professor Hugo Van Warden, then the NHS Highlands Director of Public Health, following the tragic death of a full-term baby at the unit in 2015. The report of the review, which included two external reviews, recommended that the maternity unit in Caithness move to a midwife-led unit to address safety issues. This change was unanimously agreed by the NHS Highland Board. The model of care that operates in Caithness is, of course, similar to models that operate in other parts of NHS Highland and indeed other NHS boards in Scotland. The member will be aware of the work that is underway in the Best Start North Review, commissioned jointly by Grampian Highland and three island health boards. The work of the review group was paused during COVID, but has recently restarted, led by the directors of midwifery from all six uh, northern uh, boards. Rhoda Grant. The Cabinet Secretary has carried out independent reviews of Murray maternity services and now has commenced one in Dumfries and Galloway. The review carried out by NHS Highland was not independent of NHS Highland and concerns around the maternity services have been ongoing since that change was made back in 2016 when obstetric cover was removed. Women are having to travel over 100 miles to give birth. That's like asking a woman from Edinburgh to travel to Newcastle to give birth, and that's absolutely unacceptable. So will he stop the centralisation of maternity services away from Caithness, admit it was a mistake, and, co and commit to having a full independent review as soon as possible? Cabinet Secretary. I really regret uh, Ms Grant's tone in terms of her question, or even her implication. That, uh, it's important for us to remember, as I stated in my original answer, that the review was carried out after the really tragic death of a full-term baby at the unit in 2015. That was the circumstances behind why there was a review. And of course, that review did include two external uh, reviews as part of the overall review. And that, that review, the basis in the back of that very tragic death, uh, then uh, recommended that Keith Ness move to a midwife-led unit to address those safety issues. Uh, Ms Grant is also wrong to say that I have commissioned uh, an independent review in relation to maternity services in Wigtonshire. The local health board has uh, decided to commence uh, an independent review into maternity services in Wigtonshire uh, on the 18th of January. Now, that is a decision for the health board. The health board in Highland, of course, are part of the Best Start North, uh, Best Start North review, uh, which will, of course, look at uh, how uh, uh, maternity services uh, uh, how they operate right across uh, Highland, uh, and, and, and I hope that uh, Rhoda Grant uh, will undoubtedly uh, collaborate and take part uh, in that review. Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm if the Scottish Government has reviewed the conclusions of the risk assessments for each maternity patient who is in labour that has been transferred from Caithness General to Raigmore Hospital? And if not, Will he? Cabinet Secretary. Again, these are, these are important decisions uh, and important uh, risk assessments for local health boards to take. And I, what I would say is, of course, I understand the concerns that are raised legitimately by Edward Mountain, raised by Rhoda Grant. I myself have met the campaign group uh, chat uh, last year, and as a result of that, I know there's now face-to-face -face formal meetings between NHS Highland uh, and the campaign group. But NHS Highland does have in place uh, protocols uh, in, in place to mitigate the risks that are associated with the transfer of pregnant women, particularly in an emergency situation. So those protocols are in place. The Best Start North review has commenced, and I would encourage, uh, as I have encouraged Rhoda Grant, I would encourage Edward Mountain to engage in that review. Question number two, Julian Martin. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the development of a menopause specialist network. Minister Marie Todd. The action in the Women's Health Plan to develop a national menopause specialist network has been completed. 
The network has been meeting since 2021 to provide consistent advice, peer support and share good practice amongst healthcare professionals, including primary care teams. The network meets on a quarterly basis and includes representatives from all mainland NHS boards. Julian Martin. I thank the Minister for, for that answer. It was recently estimated that in the UK over 900,000 employees left their jobs over an undefined period because of the impact of menopause symptoms. In addition to better clinical support for women during menopause, better understanding and support is needed in workplaces. Now, I know I'm potentially creeping into another minister's remit here, but I would like to ask if, in the spirit of cross-portfolio working, if some work could be done within the Women's Health Brief to better inform workplaces on the menopause and get meaningful policies in place, perhaps starting with our own NHS, which, after all, employs many women, women we cannot afford to lose from the workplace. Minister. Uh, our Women's Health Plan highlights the need to consider women as rounded individuals with a range of needs and we are committed to working across portfolios to achieve our aim of reducing health inequalities and improving health outcomes for women, including in the workplace. Menopausal women are the fastest growing demographic in the workforce, so it is important and more important now than ever to speak um, about openly about the menopause at work. Through the Women's Health Plan, we're developing support for both employers and those experiencing symptoms of the menopause. And that includes menopause and menstrual health workplace policy for NHS Scotland as an example of best practice to promote across the public, private and third sector. Jackie Bailey. Last week, the Scottish Government published its Women's Health Progress Report, which was delayed by six months. Can the Minister explain why the establishment of a dedicated menopause policy post has not been achieved? Because in the Government's own implementation plan, this was classed as a short-term action, so it should have been delivered within the year. When will an appointment be made? Minister. So I, I'm very proud of the progress we've made in the first year of the Women's Health Plan and of course Scotland was the first country in the UK to put forward a Women's Health Plan. I have been very clear from the moment I took this post that actually we have a great deal of work to do to overturn the millennia of discrimination and disadvantage that women face. I think we've done great work on menopause. We've put forward, as I said in my previous answer, the access to, to a specialist menopause workforce. We have busted myths about the menopause on our NHS for, Inform website. And I'm really proud of the progress that we've made. I'm happy to update Jackie Bailey in writing with the specific question that she asked. Question number three, Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to support young people with speech difficulties. Cabinet Secretary Hamza Yusuf. We want to intervene early to prevent speech difficulties arising in young people. An important part of our efforts to address this has been to increase our health visiting workforce by more than 500 since 2014 and expand uh, funded early learning and childcare to the 11.40 hours to all eligible children. Both are critical to supporting children's early language development. We also recognise the importance of timely access to speech and language therapy. Uh, we have increased the flexibility health boards have in reducing waiting times, ensuring those with the greatest need are seen first, while maximising prevention and early intervention approaches for those who are waiting. Jamie Green. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary talks about early intervention, but the reality is there is a two-year waiting list in North Ayrshire to see a children's speech therapist, therapist. In fact, the list is now closed and parents are having to go private. Uh, to, and pay for uh, assistance for their children. There is a two-tier system of speech therapy in Scotland due to chronic underfunding and a nationwide lack of speech therapists. I am sure members across the chamber will be experiencing similar issues. Minister, how have we let things get so bad? Early intervention is absolutely key to the uh, learning and development of young people. But if there is a two-year waiting list, then the outcomes are going to be much, much poorer. Will the Cabinet Secretary reflect on this and what is he going to do about it? Cabinet Secretary. I, I, I won't just reflect on it, we'll make sure we take action in, in this regard. And he is right, of course, to raise the issue around Ayrshire and Arran. Uh, I know about the specific challenges Ayrshire, Ayrshire and Arran have had with recruitment. In fact, they have lost uh, some, spa, some staff in their speech and language uh, therapy uh, department. And what I have asked, uh, asked the Chief Allied Health Professionals, uh, Professionals Officer to do uh, is to engage directly with the board 
and have asked, uh, she has asked them to, to Ayrshire and Arran to resume the waiting list for routine referrals, because I know that was an issue uh, of concern. I understand the decision that Ayrshire and Arran took to close the list uh, for routine referrals. It's important to say that that never affected uh, urgent referrals, urgent referrals uh, still uh, being seen. And in fact, the average uh, referral to assessment time uh, is four days. In terms of uh, uh, where I don't agree with uh, Jamie Green is uh, his suggestion that the NHS has been chronically underfunded, that is incorrect. Of course, we are putting record investment in our NHS with a record £19 billion for 2023 24. Question number four, Lee MacArthur. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the work of the Ferries Task Force with Orkney Islands Council. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. President Officer, the Transport Minister and I had a useful meeting with representative, representatives of Orkney Islands Council earlier this week. We discussed a range of matters about how best to support the Council with the challenges it faces in delivering its ferry responsibilities, and we look forward to continuing discussions. Liam MacArthur. Uh, can I thank the Deputy First Minister for that uh, answer? Welcome the meeting uh, on Tuesday. And given how late in the day the meeting was arranged, uh, welcome the fact that I think a further meeting is due to take place uh, in April. Uh, it is important, vital, I would say, that ministers remain involved in this process. And given the impact on island communities in Orkney of increased disruption to services due to the age of the internal ferry fleet, not to mention the costs and the impact uh, through higher emissions, uh, what confidence, uh, what reassurance can the Deputy First Minister offer my constituents that this is a process that will lead ultimately to a fund package that will allow the replacement of that fleet. Cabinet Secretary. I, I think the fact that the, uh, the work is underway should be reassurance to Mr MacArthur's constituents. I recognise the significance of the issues involved and the necessity of there being reliable inter-island inter ferries and connections for his constituents. Uh, we have embarked on the work that is necessary to explore these issues and we look forward to sustain that work with our Islands Council. Jamie Halker Johnston. Uh, I'm pleased this meeting has finally taken place and that the talks were, at least in the Scottish Government's own finest ministerial techno speak, positive and constructive. However, I'm not aware of any agenda um, being published ahead of the meeting. So, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to ensure full transparency of the discussions and so that local residents in Orkney can have confidence that this isn't just another talking shop and, or as one local councillor put it, a placating tactic. When will full detailed minutes of the meeting be publicly available and when will, when will the agenda for the next talks be published? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, it's nice. It's nice to see that Mr Halker Johnson is able to summon up a really warm welcome for the government's dialogue with Orkney Islands Council. It really is another further, it's another, it's another further descent into the miserableism of the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party. Uh, the, um, and, uh, there is an abundance of miserableism on the Scottish Conservative benches. On if you could day. answer the question briefly, so, please. Presiding officer, as... As, as with all things, as with all things, there will be full transparency from the Scottish Government. Thank I do. you, members. I do. Members, I do. we will, I do we will hear the Cabinet Secretary. We will hear the Cabinet Secretary. We have a finite amount of time and a lot of interest, and I would be grateful if we could get through business. Cabinet Secretary. And there's a finite time that we've got to put up with the nonsense we get from the Scottish Conservatives. <laughs> Uh, I, simply, I simply reiterate, presiding officer, that the government will apply full transparency to all of the deliberations we have with Orkney Islands Council. Thank you. Question number five, John Mason. A thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on whether any increased number and cost of commissions and commissioners for which it is responsible will mean resources being diverted away from frontline services. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Officer, the financial resources sought by such office holders to support their respective functions are provided for in relevant Acts of Parliament, which is a matter for the Parliament. It is a, a simple matter of fact, however, that the more office holders there are and the more resources they utilise, the less will be available for public services. I have been open with Parliament about the scale of the pressures we currently face in the public finances and it is vital that all public bodies and office holders contain their costs. John Mason. I yeah, thank the Deputy First Minister for that response. It's been suggested that we might be heading towards 14 commissioners. And I wonder if he would agree that, say, perhaps it means that some sectors with a commissioner have a louder voice and other sectors without a commissioner are not heard so well. 
Cabinet Secretary. President, so this is a, 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 a difficult issue for the government to judge upon because essentially the legislation to establish commissioners are matters for Parliament. And Parliament also, through the work of the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body, has to regulate or advise on the regulation of the financial assistance that is made available to office holders. And that's a difficult issue for the government to control because it, has the, it would potentially have the government intruding on the right and proper space that is available for Parliament to determine these issues. And I'm acutely conscious of the necessity to respect that boundary. Mm -hmm. Having said that, all of us, whether we are members of the government or members of the opposition, have a duty to recognise the, the pressures that exist on the public finances and that should be reflected in the financial support that is available to office holders and the number of office holders that we have in place. Question number six, Ros McCall. To ask the Scottish Government what impact its Town Centre Action Plan is having in communities in Mid Scotland and Fife region. Minister Tom Arthur. In Mid Scotland and Fife, the Scottish Government is delivering on Town Centre Action with more than £22 million of funding provided to local authorities for local projects since 2019 through our place-based investment programme and town centre fund. A further £4.5 million is being invested through the Regeneration Capital Grant Fund over the period 2020-2023 alone. We are also supporting community wealth building pilots in Fife and we are working collaboratively with the Coalfields Regeneration Trust in the area on climate action. Ross McCall. I appreciate the response from the Minister, but um, I think he's missing the point. I've asked this question in three different ways, two in, a, in writing and again today, and I keep getting told that we have a plan and another plan, but the plans are not working. Short, short. We will briefly suspend business at this point. Thank you. If we may re recommence, and if um, Minister Tom Arthur could complete his response to Ms McCall. Thank you. Pre Presiding officer, I had completed my response. It was a supplementary. Sorry, sorry, excuse me. Ms McCall. Ah, thank you. Um, I do appreciate the response from the Minister, but I think he misses the point. I've asked this question in three different ways, two writing and again twice today. Um, and I keep getting told that we have a plan and another plan, but the plans are not working. Shop vacancy rates remain unchanged, with one in six stores in our high streets lying empty. That's the highest in the UK. The volume of empty units in shopping centres remain at more than 20%. That's completely unchanged. Calls from the industry bodies to match the 75% 
rates relief for small businesses to match the rest of the United Kingdom are being ignored. So what tangible evidence does the Minister have that these multiple plans will make any impact whatsoever on the communities in Mid-Scotland and Fife? Minister. I'm, I'm grateful to the, to the member for the supplementary question. This is a, is a complex area. Our, our town centres face systemic challenges going back many, many years. And of course, they have faced the acute crisis of the pandemic and indeed the current cost crisis. Now, there's, there's three aspects in terms of how we address that. There is clear strategic direction, which we are providing. There is partnership working with COSLA and local communities. And of course, there is funding, which I outlined in my original answer. There is going to be no short-term fix, no overnight solution to the challenges that our town centres face. It is not unique to Scotland that we have a strategic approach through our town centre action plan, through our retail strategy and through our community, community wealth building aspirations. And indeed, I launched a consultation on community wealth building earlier this week. And we see in Mid-Scotland and Fife, in Clackmannanshire and in Fife, pilot areas supported by the Scottish Government. This is a complex Briefly, Minister. area. We are providing funding. We are working in partnership. And I extend an invitation to the member and indeed any member who wishes to discuss these complex issues in more detail. Thank you, Minister. I am more than happy to meet to do so.